And we are live again on another wonderful weekly episode of Unicorn Chef. First of all, I'd like to apologize to all of the viewers. The last two weeks, you had to deal with Mike Ellis. I know it's humorous, and sometimes this show is heavy on entertainment and calamity versus content. Um, so thank you for sticking with us, and we're actually going to cook something good tonight. That's how we do it. Um, I'm back from Puerto Rico, but I'm bringing the island attitude with me. And I'm joined by an awesome guest, Ryan Kovar, a.k.a. MeanSec, who has a wonderful charity to highlight for tonight. Ryan? Hey, uh, super happy to be here. Very excited. I love cooking, and I love cooking on Twitter and Instagram and all the different places. So this is a, a match made in heaven. And I'm excited to show you actually how to broil unicorn roast. So we'll, we'll get to that for the after action. But... As you said, the charity, uh, Rural Technology Fund, for those of you who know Chris Sanders, he's um, one of the nicest human beings I've ever met, and I think a lot of other folks. And he has a great charity about helping schools uh, in rural areas. If you're not familiar with it, a lot of times they don't have access to technology, which I think anyone watching this show on YouTube streaming from a platform like StreamYard into all these different areas, like our lives depend on technology. And if you're part of that poverty class that you're not able to get access to it, um, you're going to be left behind in this new world. And Chris is making a really big difference of making sure that there's children all over America who are able to get access to that technology to have a better life. So I'm a huge fan and support if you like uh, what we cook today, or even if you don't. In fact, donate double if you hate it. <laughs> Show me wrong. Uh, how do folks uh, uh, donate? Uh, just Google Rural Technology Fund. I think it's ruraltechnologyfund.org. And Chris has a big, big happy uh, donate button there. And I'll also tweet it out once we get off the show. Okay, great. All right. Um, so one of our favorite things is seeing what you make at home. Part of how I find folks to, to invite on this is I'm just constantly looking all over for anybody that's cooking anything amazing. If you use hashtag Unicorn Chef, makes it even easier for me to find it. Um, and we love to see what you make. Um, it's neat when you see the same recipe coming out in different ways. Um, that diversity is fun. All right. Most important question to get us kicked off, Ryan. What are you drinking? So this is rather sad. I'm afraid I had to go off the primary tipple in November due to some health things. So I'm enjoying a lovely vacuum flask of crystal light. It has effervescent notes of kiwi and strawberry with a slight touch of, uh, I think that's a Spartame and sadness. Uh, how about yourself, Bryce? And over to you. <laughs> I, I have to give it to you. That is, a, I think, the most colorful and dramatic reading we've had of, of a drink yet. So you've You've already won the the shows. There we go. For that I think Thank at the you. end of the it's been year, great. Um, you know, <laughs> chicken's done and go home. We're we're done. Um, at the end of this year, uh, we're going to do a cookbook of all the episodes we've done, and I think I'm probably going to have to have an awards show of some type. And I think you've just won dramatic reading for a drink. So. Dramatic reading for uh, that's yeah. Well, this is now full of sadness. It's uh, I've never gotten an award for something I dislike more. <laughs> Um, I am drinking a Sachetto uh, Pinot Grigio. Oh. So just uh, I thought it was a, a nice, um, uh, has a hint of apple in it. Um, it is crisp, refreshing. Um, I've been chilling it, so I thought it would go really well with uh, the meal tonight. So it, it should do, because if you, if you make it like I do, not like my mother, uh, it's going to have a little hit of a spice. And the Pinot Grigio, a little sweetness with a crisp wine will go very well, in my opinion. Sounds good. Chef, lead us away. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is bring you over to my workstation to show the mise en place that I did before we actually started this. So let's see. There we go. Yeah, we'll, we'll back up a little bit, and I'll figure out how computers work. So this is pretty much everything you'll need for the meal. Um, we got some light issues there, but you see I always keep a nice little trash bag next to me, a little paper one for mostly what I'm doing here are going to be things for the compost pile. Uh, I'm going to be using an 8-inch... There we go. Yeah, there he is right there. Eight inch cast iron because I, I love cast iron. This is actually about a 90 year old cast iron pan that my mom gave me. And then hey, over hey, here. Ryan, oh, so yeah. size doesn't, size isn't important. Mine being nine inches isn't, isn't going to be a no problem. No issue at all. Sorry all right. about You're not intimidated you by my pan. Um, I'm sure I'm the first man. Maybe I'm not. Um, your size doesn't matter, Bryson. It's just how you use the pan. Okay. Less, like, life lesson there. It's all about how you grease the pan. Speaking of, I like cast iron, but maybe you want to use a baking pan. If you're making this for a family of 20, uh, use as much as you want. It's all kind of horizontally scalable as much as you will. 
we'll get you set up again over here very delicately. Come on, play nicely. Oh, well, maybe you'll go here now. Now you live here. How wonderful. So I'm going to grab the chicken from the fridge and then clean off my mise en place. And for this, I'm using chicken thighs. I think chicken thighs taste like heaven. Uh, you can also use chicken breasts. Uh, they're a little bit healthier, but a little less interesting in my opinion, but both work fine. Um, I always use skinless and boneless for this because that's how my mother made it, which has to be good. She's a great chef or a great cook, I guess. There's a little bit of a difference. So really all I'm doing right now off screen is moving things off the uh, work area that I'm going to be cutting. I'm going to put my pan over here just for funsies. One, this is probably the only two special things that I say kind of are key for this ingredient. You don't need it though. This is just a meat hammer. Uh, I often just use cast iron or anything else to flatten out the chicken, which we'll do here in a minute. Um, and the only festival, the only thing I always tell people that they should buy, in my opinion, is a thermopen. Um, it's probably the only piece of specialized cooking gear that I can't live without. You can use any thermometer, but I like the instant read on these. Um, and you can find them on sale for about 60 to $70 online, uh, which is pretty good for something that I use just about every day of my life for cooking to make sure I don't die. So I have now cleaned off my workspace primarily. And I actually did a test run of this earlier. I was able to get everything pretty much done in 15 minutes, but I wasn't talking to a handsome man on screen. So we will see. Uh, the one other key ingredient here that we're talking about today, for those of you not from the Southwest, I don't know how well you can see this, but I have hatched chilies roasted from Central Market in Texas. Uh, roasted warm spicy hatch chili peppers, which are delicious. Um, I like spice in this dish. It's not how I was raised with it. It's something I've started to add in, but I've used Serrano. I've used bird's eye when I lived in the UK. I've used jalapeno. I've used habanero. Um, I've used poblano. I've used um, chipotle, uh, all sorts of different peppers. Uh, I just like the taste and the smoke that comes from roasted hatch chilies. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and take the chicken out of the bag here. And I will, as always, have a little bit of a dish towel here over my shoulder. Uh, for those of you, I'm going to assume many people here have dealt with chicken and know the dangers of salmonella. So I have, a little hard to see because it's not in camera, but I have a silicone work mat down. I have a piece of plastic here that's going to help me smoosh my chicken when I'm pounding it. And I'm going to pound these flat. Now I'm going to do three because as I said, I actually already did one earlier today to make sure I wasn't full of shit. Um, oh no, I have four. There's a hidden one. So I have four of these. You can do as much as you want. I don't really have a lot of, usually I'm a very scientific uh, cook. This because it came from my mother is very much a pinch until it's done, use as much as you want until it fills the pan, all sorts of stuff like that. So I have put out actual ingredients based on the last time I made this, but you can scale up and scale down as much as you want. Uh, what I do is I take the chicken thigh and there's two sides to a chicken thigh. There's the ugly side and the prettier side. And notice I'm only using one hand to ever touch the chicken. So what I tend to do is I put the pretty side up, as in the side that isn't all cut up. Then I take my piece of plastic, I put it over, and mind you, I'm doing this all on top of a silicone mat that later on I will sterilize. And now comes the loud part. What I'm doing is just flatten these out. So flat, 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 pound, pound, pound. I usually get them to be about a quarter of an inch thick, maybe less. But really what you're doing here, and whenever you pound out meat, your entire goal is not for presentation, but rather to make sure that you have even cooking. That's the entire idea, right? Cooking is just science. So when I pound this out, I'm just doing it to get a uniform thickness for cooking so that as I cook, everything comes out at the same time and no one dies from food poisoning. Unless it's Mick Baccio, in which case I often give him raw meat just to see what happens. <laughs> so we're pounding, we're pounding. Now this is starting to sound like a different type of video streaming service. A lot of raw oh, chicken breasts. And, hey, ooh, just on. saying. We, we leave the X-rated and R-rated comments to the comments. Uh, to the commentaries? <laughs> okay, so <laughs> I think we're almost good here. If I knew it was going to be that kind of episode, I would have worn rubber gloves. Oh, stop. Okay. That was a falling knife. I now have flattened chicken breast. I'm going to throw away. Well, I'm not going to put it in there because that's compost. 
I'm going to wash my hands of the chicken breasts or the chicken thighs, and I'll be right back after these messages. Bryson, keep the audience occupied. All right. So we've got a poll in uh, the comments on chicken breast or thighs. Which one would you do? We only have one vote so far, and that's thighs. Well, there you go. And that was me, actually, with my third hand. You can see it, but there we were. So <laughs> now we have immaculately clean hands with no salmonella lurking. No, we got um, we got a bunch of lurkers, but they're not they're not posting their comments for the vote. Oh well. There we go. So thighs. There All we right. go. We got two for thighs. All right, we got some chicken thighs pounded out here. Thighs. Get another. All right, so we're thighs. Thighs seem to be taking thighs the win. Part. Cool. Okay, so now we're going to work on a couple different things. One is I'm going to go ahead and butter my cast iron. Um, I'm doing this a la ma, mi madre, so I'm just going to do exactly as she did, which is I take out my stick of butter, which I'd already cut, and I just kind of butter the bottom of it just to have a little bit of fat to lubricate when we put this back in. Then I put that to the side. You could use olive oil. You could use any sort of a neutral oil. I like butter. Uh, I've obviously never avoided butter in my life. And then I'm going to take full fat cream cheese. I often use two thirds fat cream cheese, but this is what they had in the store today. And I'm going to cut about, uh, I'll probably start with about four ounces of it. My cream cheese has a little measuring. That's about one third of a traditional American container of Philadelphia cream cheese. You can see here, that's about how much I have. Um, I play around with this depending on how much chicken I'm going to make. So there's not really a defined amount there as much as whatever is right for the amount of chicken you're making. If you're making six or 10 or 15 or scaling up, then you're obviously gonna want that to be a little bit more. So what I do with that is I scrape out all the goodness out of the leftover cream cheese. I put that into a bowl. And then I actually go ahead right now and I whip it with a fork. You're not trying to do anything other than just kind of break up the break up the cream cheese, make it a little bit more accepting for what we're about to put into it here in a minute. Okay, so, so this is uh, this is the foreplay. This is foreplay. We're we're just whipping. This is the Fifty Shades of Cream Cheese. Um, when you're done, it should just look beaten. Something kind of similar to that. I was trying to think. Yeah, there we go. So uh, Mike asked a question in there. Um, this was uh, we covered this on a previous episode about how we mix butter and olive oil to increase the smoke point, and mm -hmm. you don't get the the solids. But I think we're not going to be cooking as high heat here for the butter, so you don't have to worry about that. Correct. Absolutely. Um, and I do that quite a bit, especially. I think you had a wonderful episode on making steak. A lot of times when I do a butter fried steak. Uh, to finish with butter, I'll actually add in a neutral oil like safflower or um, canola even to, as you said, temper the butter to raise the heating point where you still get the delicious flavor of the butter, but it doesn't burn immediately and tastes crappy. So, so where you that. Uh, I am in Dallas, right near oh, SMU. I'm, I'm where sorry. My... <laughs> wow, that, that hurts. I mean, if I was from Dallas, I'd be a lot more sad, but... Um, <laughs> They don't own you. They, they don't own me. And in, in fact, until pandemic, I was ever never actually here. So even though I had a house here, um, I was traveling about 60%, 70 90%. So I'm going to take my chicken right now and just put it a little bit off to the side and then sneeze. Hopefully not on the chicken. Hold, please. Bless you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Luckily, I'm just cooking for myself. So now I have a mise en place that has no chicken bits because I did this all very carefully and immaculately somewhere else. I have the cream cheese, which I see you're still mixing about a bit. Um, I'm going to use another specialty unitasker, as Alton Brown would say, and I only recently started doing this and I like it. This was a Kenji Alt Lopez recommendation. Uh, this specific garlic press by Zlice, I really liked, uh, but I usually just cut garlic by hand. Uh, but right now I'm just mincing up some garlic um, to go into the cream cheese. So I'm going to do that real fast. I've already got my garlic diced. So I'm just going to. Very nice. I didn't know how much prep I wanted to do for this. I was like, wow, how do I eat up all that time? That's and, your uh, show, Ryan. My show. Well, we're going to get freaky here in a second then. So I'm oh. just taking the garlic and I'm just shoving that right into the cream cheese. I'm not mixing it or anything yet. I'm just popping it in. 
So we'll pop that through. Like I said, this guy makes it pretty easy, but it's also very easy just to do garlic by hand. Uh, these are kind of a ridiculous invention. I actually really like garlic. This is a good place to say you should do what inspires you. Oh, on this uh, show, so, there's no such thing as too much garlic. We encourage like garlic on top of garlic. Like that's... Then, then you, I usually put in double whatever. The, I, I kind of think of it like the, whatever people say the recommended amount of garlic is, they're just wrong uh, because obviously the answer is more. So add in as much as you think you'd like, but I usually do something like a clove for every two um, entities of chicken, whether that be breast or otherwise. Um, yeah, I did that and took it to an exponent of like three then you're fine because it's all just going to taste delicious. Oh, gorgeous. I love it. Love it. All right. So I'm putting in more garlic myself. Everything's going to taste garlicky and wonderful. Okay. And as I said, I'm not doing anything with it yet. I'm just putting it in, but you can start stirring or not. It doesn't really matter. I'm going to put that to the side. Then I'm going to take two scallions or green onions. doesn't really matter, but here's the two that I have. Um, and then you're going to slice those, thinly slice all of it. So the dark parts and the green parts, just quickly slice down. It should be about an eighth or a sixteenth of an inch little uh, things, as best you can. Uh, if you're not comfortable using a knife, I highly recommend watching videos by Jacques Pepin, uh, who has the best knife handling skills I've ever seen. And he's a phenomenal educator. He taught me everything I know virtually about doing knife work. And I really like them. If you're not familiar with his work, but pretty much learned everything I know about cooking from Jacques Pepin, Julia Childs, Kenji Alt Lopez, and Meathead for smoking meat. Uh, I did a, an homage to Julia Child for Pancakes Con 2. Oh, really? What'd you do? I did uh, an introduction to detection engineering while at the same time I created a cocoa van. And I did it all within whatever my time frame was. Oh, that's nice. Scott Roberts did uh, a talk at SANS CTI a couple of years ago, which was basically ramen. Uh, it was a ramen talk about SANS CTI. And originally he was going to make the ramen on stage. And weirdly enough, the hotel said, no, you're not um, doing that. So, so I've known Scott for, I don't know, like 14, 15 years. Um, I didn't know he was a cook. Oh my I, God, is he ever? I am going to reach out to Scott. Now the bad news is like the, the, he'll, he, he, the next available slot is in July. <laughs> he is a great cook and uh, he's a huge foodie. So maybe you're not actually friends. You think about that, Bryson? Uh, awkward. 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 Awk, awk said word. Okay. So now I have spilling, but I have garlic. I have uh, greens. Yep. We look about the same. Pretty much brothers, middle-aged white men with beards. Well, not anymore. You, you shaved, unfortunately, for for mankind. I, All right. I raised, actually, I, raised, I, I I shaved for womankind. I raised womankind. UK for women's side of the That's right, you did. That was absolutely. I remember watching your step by step. It was beautiful, inspiring, arousing. Some might say. Hmm. So now I am taking it, out. Lord Cyberbottom. It it was the mustache. That's what did it, right? It was. It was honestly. Yeah. Um, so normally I have surgical gloves, uh, but thanks to COVID and the world that we are, I'm just out of them. So I'm just using a baggie for my peppers because I have put peppers in my eyes. You've, so, you've made that mistake before. Yeah, we've all made that mistake once, but I have this you know, beautiful... The eyes are not the worst place you could have done because I've done the other one. Oh my, uh, the mouth? Well, it was like, you know, you doing? wash your hands and you think you got all the oils off and then, you know, like you go to the bathroom and then... It's, it's the like, oils that get you. It's the... Yeah, it's the oils. And so you, the oils. you soap gets the oil off. And I thought, I mean, I'd done all the right things. I'd washed my hands. I'd been careful. Nope. Doesn't just, matter. Just no, it's just enough. Yep. Just so enough. that is why I'm doing a very weird, awkward thing with this hot chili, which smells delicious. It was roasted yesterday. Uh, absolutely glorious. And I'm just going to take that off and hold the chili. And I'm going to cut that up into, once again, small pieces and try ever so hard not to hurt myself. Um, like I said, I love the smell and taste of roasted hatch chili. If it's too hot for you, try something else or don't put it all in at all. When I grew up in upstate New York, we did not have chilies available in that part of the country. So this was very much not chili induced. Um, you, so are you going to also blister them to, to the, the core? Not meat? for this recipe. Uh, I'm just going to okay. basically quarter or, you know, get them down to pretty small little chunks, uh, 
about a quarter of an inch by quarter inch or smaller and then put them in. So, uh, but yeah, absolutely. A lot of times I do blister them, but this time they actually came pre-roasted and pre-grilled. So I don't really need to do much there. Otherwise, if they were raw, I would absolutely do that. Yeah. So I don't remember what episode I did that on, but sometime in the last two months, I showed how to blister. Um, in that case, I did Pablanos. So go find that episode mm -hmm. if you haven't seen it. That, that shows the technique. It adds so much more flavor to a chili to do the blistering. And it doesn't work for every chili, but especially Poblanos and Hatch, um, they're phenomenal. I even like them. If you get a jalapeno that's really thick and juicy, uh, I think they add well. So I am now have a whole bunch of hatch chilies that I'm throwing in. And at this point, we have our filling for the chicken pretty much done, uh, which makes it nice and easy. This is something my mom would make for me growing up about twice a week um, because it was literally a, usually a 30 minute meal when you're not talking about it and walking through. Um, most of the time is spent cooking or at least as much. So I'm gonna take my mixture here, and Bryce, I think you're ahead of me. I'm just gonna mix that up. And now that the cream cheese, the reason we whipped the cream cheese earlier is it lets you load up the cream cheese more. If you have the solid block in and you don't whip it, then you start bruising things. So I always like to have it already whipped a little bit, which breaks down the cohesion, which makes it easier to create a little mess. A little bit of, a little bit of happiness there. Okay, so with that, I have like, by whipping it and mixing it, I end up getting a little bit of a ball of cream cheese that looks kind of green, which is lovely. So I'm gonna put my chilies away before I manage to put my hand in it. And then if you haven't used hatch chilies before, they freeze phenomenally. I usually do a vacuum sealer on them and then put them in and keep a date on them and take them out when I need them for things. Cause I rarely ever need um, a pound, 1.12 pounds of hatch chili, especially when it's that hot. So I'm gonna bring my chicken home which was sitting over here, not that far away. Here we go. You could have also been safer and put it in the refrigerator. And I'm gonna use kosher salt. Oh, here we go, Morton. Sponsored by Morton's, the world's best salt coming to you fresh from the only the world's finest salt domes. There we go. I mean, I went real kosher. Oh, David, there we go. That's proper. So Bryson, why do you use uh, why do you use kosher salt? Why do you use coarse kosher salt for salting meats? I don't know, Ryan. Why do you? Ah, fascinating question. The sodium content of salt by weight is always equal. However, sodium flakes in kosher salt have nice little spikes, and they actually enter into the meat faster. So when you use kosher salt, you can put on a little bit less, but it gets in deeper and helps break down the meat. Um, when I do barbecue or steaks, I usually salt 24 to 12 hours, so 36 hours ahead of time. Lots of great stuff there. And if we go by the Kenji Alt Lopez method here, I kind of make it look like it snowed a little bit. Um, we're going to be adding cheese to this chicken, and that cheese will eat up any of the salt tastes. So I kind of make it look like, uh, I think someone once described it, a parking lot after a quick light snow. So there you go. Um I pepper it, salt it, throw away the rest. Then I take my pepper grinder, the fancy one I've had way too long. I'm just applying this. Are you are you familiar with uh, Alan Friedman's um, uh, salt pep uh, salt uh, grinder co collection? No, pepper grinder, pepper grinder connect collect uh, collection. No, I am not. Oh, so Alan Friedman, uh, we did a, a special Hanukkah episode. Um, he's obviously of S bomb fame. Uh, congratulations yeah. to him starting over at CISA this week. Um, Super exciting. He has an entire pepper grinder collection, and he will give talks on all the different types of like ways to do pepper. Hmm. I will be finding that. Okay, so I have my chicken all done. Hopefully you guys can see. And... Because of the power of TV magic, I probably actually would have flipped that around so the ugly side was inside, but that's okay. What we're gonna do now is take the cream cheese with all the mixtures and just apply it liberally on top of each one of the chicken thighs or chicken breasts. And I usually start by just putting a dollop, about an equal amount of dollop, so a dollop being a healthy tablespoon on each one of the chicken parts and then spreading it out with a knife or a fork on top of the chicken. Or your hands, if you're me. Or your hands, one or the other. I'm trying to avoid the peppers, um, but you know, you live on the edge, sir. 
You're a man. He's still intoxicated from Puerto Rico. <laughs> Oye, como va? Bryson, Oye, como va? Okay. Keep putting that through. And the idea is you're going to have a healthy portion. Most of the top of the chicken is going to be covered. You don't need to make it neat because you're going to be rolling this up and then covering with paprika here in a minute. And then just try to get all the cream cheese that you have out and about. Spread over, spread over. As usual, as always, I try to keep one hand untainted by whatever it is I'm doing so that I can move things around. If that appeals to you, please do so. If it doesn't, then disregard my advice and be Bryson. Do whatever you want. Kitchen should be fun. Yeah, there you go. Play with your play with your raw chicken. Okay. So I have this. And for those of you watching at home, this is what my chicken looks like. Well, that's me, not the chicken. Okay, there we go. There I will. This is this is mine. I'm willing to use my hands. Oh, beautiful. Because I'm going in and I'm going to be rolling them with both hands anyway. Well, so. I mean, you're 100% right. I don't know why I went through all that because what we're about to do now is roll this up tighter than uh, something that would be found in Jamaica back when I didn't have a clearance. So I'm going to take my <laughs> cast iron. It's here. actually, you know, I mean, it's always funny. Everybody makes that joke, but I mean, marijuana is illegal in Jamaica. Yeah, I know. It's. <laughs> I know. I went. I tried. It's a Mama tried to have a blunt in Jamaica town. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is roll up my chicken and literally just rolling it up. And then I put it seam down. That's that's S-E-A-M, not S-I-E-M, for those nerds, neckbeards in the back. And then I'm just going to nestle them all next to each other. And really, the size of your pan should be basically... How can I have everything nested together, not tightly, but kind of um, together? And that's not a huge thing, but it helps create a nice sauce at the end. And I'll show you an example of how you can do that better than I did uh, when I did the testing one earlier. So we now have chicken. I'm gonna wash my hands real fast so that I can use my camera. But basically I have four chicken thighs seamed down, rolled up with um, cream cheese mixture on the inside in a buttered, I think that's an eight inch cast iron pan. As Bryson pointed out in the beginning, it doesn't actually matter what you use. It just needs to be something that can handle heat. Um, very important thing that I forgot to bring up until now, but I'm sure Bryson already did this. I preheated my oven to 375 when we started. So maybe he hasn't done that. Maybe he has. I may have just ruined his dinner. Who knows? I had not done that. I was waiting for the instruction chef. Um, you I'm son of a bitch. Now, but to uh, where I was going to go is I was going to start to saute them so I could get that going to catch up. Um, at what point were we adding our paprika? That is actually right now. So take our paprika. Let me show you the, the pan that I have. So you can see it looks pretty disgusting, as chicken tends to do. And then I just apply extremely liberally until the whole thing is covered red on top. Now I use a nice sweet Hungarian paprika. I've also used a smoky Spanish paprika. Um, doesn't really matter. Bryson, do you know where paprika comes from? I don't, but I have a sweet Hungarian style paprika. Ah, oh, there you go. I like the Spice House, wonderful company in Chicago, family owned. I buy my stuff from them. They're great, but it doesn't matter. So uh, we're, what is this powdered, powdered paprika? I never, never considered this. Powdered bell peppers. Ah, right. Yeah. And red ones are the ones that have matured all the way, whereas green ones are the immature ones. So it you is. Got it. That is really interesting. Yeah. Fun food is history and chemistry and delicious and binds communities and friends on the internet. Who knew? So. I now have mine properly covered up like a nun going to church. Well, maybe not a nun, maybe a cardinal would be more catholically appropriately, catholically appropriate. There we go. And that <laughs> is, <laughs> there you go. Mine was really loud. I put myself on mute. That was much faster. So that is actually the full recipe. I just take this chicken now and I put it in the oven for basically uh, oh, actually, no, wrong. Apologies. Take it out of the oven before you do that. And I put aluminum foil on the top. 
So what we're going to do is have it cooked with aluminum foil on top at 375 for 15 minutes and then take off the aluminum foil after 15 minutes and let it cook until complete, which for a chicken thigh is 160 degrees um, inside, which is when I use my handy dandy thermopen. Key thing about measuring this, because you've rolled it, you only have about a quarter of an inch of chicken flesh in three rolls. So when you're using something as accurate as a thermopen, a lot of times you'll go from like, hey, it's 165, it's 120, it's 175, it's you know whatever it be, because you're going through the different layers of the chicken. So when you start seeing 165 all the way through, just play around a couple ways, try to get your thermometer in at different angles. But it usually takes about 15 minutes uh, for that first, well, sorry, 15 minutes, then take off the cover, and then it takes about another 15 minutes till it's done. Now, knowing that this show had a time limit, I went ahead and cooked one ahead of time, just for you. So now he's a little sad, but we have this guy, which I will cut open here in a second and then show you much more appropriately. Hopefully this abides by the rules of the unicorn chef magic, but you the way. The, the only disadvantage here is I won't be uh, able to plate and take a picture with you. Well, we still can. It's just it will be sitting around for a while, but we have lots of other things to talk about. But uh, you gave me a time limit, Bryson. I tried to hit it. So what happens when you have it nicely done up is it starts looking like this. go one day i'll figure out how computers work yeah so this is the chicken paprika now i did this before we started as well but this is usually served with rice so i went ahead and used my zogarushi rice maker to make some long green indian style of rice which is usually how i serve this on top and then while bryson's still cooking how about i do up some asparagus that sounds good. So um, my plan for this is I'm going to do mine over uh, German egg noodles. Ooh, very traditional. All right, yep. I'm going this for, is a uh, Hungarian dish, traditionally. Yep, yep. So, so I'm going with the, the, the East German egg noodles. Um, mine are actually like traditional German, so from that part of the world. Um, and then um, uh, I was actually uh, going to render some of my leftover sauce into more of like a cream sauce to work over it. Um, that is exactly. I'm going to taste mine with a side of spinach. That's beautiful. I go down that route quite a bit. If you've fully loaded your chicken, what happens is it renders itself, and then that's something to pour over, um, pour over, which I do quite happily, which is delicious. Um, so what I'm going to do while you're doing that is I got myself a, a nice handful of asparagus, which is about my favorite green vegetable. And the first thing I do is I just cut off the very bottoms of it and use that <laughs> Oddly enough, it goes to my dog, Bruno, who absolutely loves, uh, for whatever reason, absolutely loves asparagus bottoms. So I got no idea about that one. Uh, my personal desire, well, how do you like to eat asparagus or green vegetables, Bryson? How do I like to do asparagus? Yeah. What's your favorite? Um, uh, light saute. Light saute. That sounds about the same. So for me, I use a nice olive oil, hearty olive oil. Use a, I think it's about a 12 pan, 12, 12 inch skillet, and just heat that up until it's almost smoking, and then I throw this asparagus in. Yeah, I like to, I like to chase mine either with, I mean, I still garlic and everything. Um, so usually I'll have onions and garlic with it. Um, if I'm feeling lazy, I'll just have minced garlic um, and then um, a splash of lemon. Makes it nice and fresh, nice and crisp. Yeah. Um, so we, we've got some time now. Ryan, I mean, what yeah. mistakes in life led you to this show? Uh, signing up for Twitter, uh, the hellscape that is Twitter. But, uh, you know, it's funny. It's one of those things. I talk to friends. I talk to colleagues. I especially talk to women. And the variety of the complaints or discussions around Twitter is fascinating, right? And some people are like, oh, it's this you know, horrible thing that lets people talk about uh, each other or it just amps up or the drama. And 
I guess I've been really lucky. I'm very thankful. Like I've had a wonderful experience on Twitter, uh, which is one of the ways you and I introduced. I mean, I think we met actually the first time in person at AttackCon uh, 1.0 many years ago. Um, but yeah, <laughs> the time we, before times, uh, that was yeah, the uh, time before times. Yeah. Yeah. Before when you didn't have a beard, then had a beard, then didn't have a beard. Uh, I, um, I, uh, live tweeted your talk. Yeah, exactly. So that was perfect. Another, another combination of Twitter, right? So I've had wonderful relationships and friendships and opportunities come out of Twitter. Um, but really the, the worst thing that ever occurred was I, um, I have to go back to 16 when I just stopped caring about high school and I didn't do anything for two years. And then all my friends were talking about things like, Hey, I'm going to Caltech or university of Arizona or MIT. Where are you going? I was like, Oh, you have to apply for those. They don't just come to you. So I kind of decided to join the Navy and was an IT at the time I joined for any veterans out there. We had a rate called RM radio man. And I was a radio man that got converted into an IT and I said, hey, I love computers. This is great. I got to my ship, the USS Kitty Hawk, a giant aircraft carrier. And we're standing in line. And this guy comes down. And he went, you, 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 and you. Come with me. And we ended up going downstairs. And I worked in this place called ADP, which was where the computers were. I became a sysadmin, got into security, met one of my best friends and mentors who now works for me here at Splunk. It was great. And when the guy was leaving, I said, you know, you know petty officer, why did you pick me to be in the computer stuff? Like, why? I... I might have had to go up to radio and done like UHF and all those things. What, what did you see in me? And he goes, you wear glasses. Nerds wear glasses. Fucking nerds. And then walked away. So my entire life, literally everything I have today is all dependent upon that day. I didn't wear contacts. I wore glasses. And he believed that it was nerds. So that's kind of how I, uh, that's a very long answer of how I ended up there as I danced for time and put my asparagus in. There you go. That is uh, <laughs> that is really uh, funny. <laughs> like your whole life took a direction. So oh, yeah. wear glasses one day. Hundred um, percent. I have a good friend of mine. I still keep in contact with Jason Sabater, who's now a commander in the U.S. Navy. He's retiring very shortly, and uh, we we joined almost the same day. We went through boot camp at the same time. We went through school at the same time, and we showed up on the mess deck of USS Kitty Hawk. And Jason it was a Mr. America, crew cut, strong, blue eyes, no glasses, though, the poor son of a bitch. So he ended up having to go to radio, and then he said, I'm going to have to stay in the Navy for the rest of my life. This is horrible. And um, I didn't. Three years, ten months, nine days later, I was a free man. So, uh, not that well, I-, so I was an Army officer, so I, I mean, I, I never would have gone in the Navy to begin with. Well, I mean, we do have a, you know requirements but i'm sure you were fine too touche were you in a west pointer or yeah. another uh, variety yeah. yeah i was a west pointer yeah. great i had two people from my high school class we had 700 people graduate and then they listed out all the colleges and they welcomed all the people going off in the military and two of them went to west point one to the air force academy and then they said oh and ryan who enlisted <laughs> So what, what got you into cooking? You know, my mom was a great cook, but when I joined the Navy, not surprised, not much of an ability to cook. And then um, I actually lived in London for many years when I got out of the Navy, uh, working some um, spicy sort of things there. And at the time, you, you I was... in London or were you west of London? I was London, proper London. Oh, okay. Um, I, I, actually, I, spent, I spent three years in Cheltenham. Okay. Yeah, that's that's even spicier. I was working for the home office um, right across the river and right next to buildings that explode on movies about James Bond. So uh, when I was there, I fell in love with Britain and I fell in love with the food and I especially fell in love with eating curry at curry houses. So I didn't really learn to cook until I moved back to America and I wanted to eat better food than what was available at the time. I was living in Dallas at the time. And that's kind of how I got into it. And I started reading about Jacques Pepin and watching his TV shows on um, PBS with Julia Child. And then I learned about a guy named Mark Bittman. Uh, Mark Bittman has a great book called, uh, it's called How to Cook Everything and then How to Cook Everything Vegetarian, which are phenomenal books. And I actually give them to every newlywed couple um, these days, less and less as more gray in my beard grows up. But um, 
how to cook everything is wonderful. It's an encyclopedic book. It's about four inches thick and it's literally, Hey, what do you have in your fridge? What do you have in your pantry? Here's something you can make that's pretty easy to do and take away. So if you're not a great cook or you want to learn more, that's a phenomenal book that got me started. Um, then kind of went down the route, but I say probably the biggest evolution in my cooking came about five years ago when I learned about serious eats and Kenny, um, you know, Ken G. Alt Lopez and reading his work about really how cooking is just science. And that was a real transformative experience for me of just really breaking it down into what you're doing when you're applying heat. What are you doing when you apply salt? Adding a scientific method of trying things iteratively over and over again with a scientific method of logging your changes. And that really appealed to me. And I kind of got much more into it. And then I got really into barbecue. And for barbecue, that's as much science as it is art. Uh, but at this point, I can make barbecue better than just about anywhere else in Dallas that I can eat. So there's only a couple places that I go to. And that's going to go loud. Um, so for things like that, I just learned more and more about cooking and the things I liked and didn't like and how to apply heat, how to apply salt, what oil did. You know, there's things like what you talked about earlier, which I think is key, is you know, understanding why you put oil into butter, right? Why do you do this? Not just blindly doing them. And when you figure out like, oh, it's about the burning point of the fats in the solids in butter because it's a dairy product versus oil and the different boiling burning points of different oils. Like that's, once you learn those basics, you can cook just about anything. Mm -hmm. So that's really been how I got into it. And now we have a dog who's come to visit me. So, um, I mean, when I think of the real, like, thorough science of, of producing food, I think of baking, which oh, yeah. is all chemistry. And then certainly uh, in cooking, we benefit from understanding the, the science of what's happening. But there's so much more of the feel of it. Yep. My, uh, my wife is a phenomenally good cook, uh, but she is not a great baker because she's very inspired uh, when she cooks and baking is not something you can be inspiring on. You just have to follow the fucking recipe. That is, that's uh, me. I don't follow the recipe. I never have a recipe. I'm like, what do I feel today? And that's what yep. I'm going to make. And well, I don't it just uh, for cooking that works out phenomenally well for baking. It leads you to, this is great. I think it was supposed to be six inches tall, not one inch tall. Um, but well, it also works well in cooking when you know what you're doing. <laughs> well, that's the other thing. When you have a base of knowledge, like this, I was talking about this the other day. My, my hobby over COVID was I wanted to learn how to cook Indian food. And so I spent all summer. Yep. Perfect. I spent all summer learning how to cook Indian food. And one of the biggest things you learned was that you have to um, understand what the base sauces are and what to understand the base. And what I hadn't realized is I had Anglo- Anglo Franco centricized my cooking because everything I cooked was pretty much French based or English based or American. I don't really cook much Italian and learning that for Indian, like there's some base sauces, like you're going to go through more garlic and ginger than you ever thought was possible in your life. And that's just one of those things. And there's six or seven key spices for Indian food that you have to learn to use. And, you know, and the fats are different. You know, one of the other things I learned, I started, I went down a, a wonderful YouTube rat hole of watching aunties in India cook food. And one of the biggest things is they only use red onions. Like they don't use a sweet bedalias or white onions or yellow onions that we tend to use for European cooking. They use red onions. So like one of the first things I noticed when I started cooking Indian food was by shifting to red onions. It tasted a lot more like the food that I ate when I lived in London or when I traveled abroad or when I go to San Jose and eat at legitimate, you know, Indian restaurants. The other big thing is Indian food is not India. It's a subcontinent of a billion people, right? And most of the food that I think of as Indian is actually a very specific region of India that's very close to Pakistan that is what they serve in UK curry houses. But India itself has dozens of different unique and delicious regional cuisines. And so I kind of work through all those. So I actually just turned off the heat on my asparagus as well. So uh, we did a we did an episode from India with uh, Suchi Pahi. Oh, really? That's yeah. fascinating. What was your What was your favorite thing? What'd you learn? I don't remember specifically what I learned. What? This is bullshit, Bryson. I was promised 
encyclopedic knowledge. I expect yeah, more from Encyclopedic West knowledge of the 75 episodes by exactly every single detail. I'm afraid I can remember that they happened. I have to focus a little bit more to remember exactly I, what I'm happened. sorry. Is it, is it wrong to expect perfection? No. Uh, I, I'm not going to say you let everyone down, but awkward. Ryan, it wouldn't be the first time or the last time. Smash that like button to unliked and go somewhere else. That's all I have to say. That's the uh, yeah. The I don't think I've made handle. the pantheon of your list, but um, <laughs> we we do cover quite a diversity of 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 different kinds of things every single week. Um, I and... I have spent um, you know I was doing some rewatch and I'm upset I missed that one because I love Indian cooking. So uh, now I have yeah, something they... to do when we get off. So the, the other one I would recommend um, is uh, Amelie Karan. Uh, she yeah. did uh, Thai. Um, oh, fun. And I have to admit, the recipe at first we had reminded me of eating off, like eating in um, the food trucks of Bangkok. Like at, in the evening, those things roll out, the plastic furniture goes out, and everybody just sits and eats in the streets. Her, yeah. her recipe Sim, Sim was, Ket. Rem, yes, it reminded me of that. That is wonderful because I have not gotten that into Thai food. I got in a real big health kick earlier this year and lost a lot of weight. And one of the things that's really been getting through, and I can't remember the Thai name, and Mick would probably kill me if I pronounced it anyway, but the basil chicken, uh, basil chicken, uh, I think a larb, larb salad, basically. Um, that's so easy to make. That was one of the ones I was thinking about doing for the cooking show because I make that a lot. And that's just, once again, it's something that a lot of times I spend time on Sunday cooking and then I just go ahead and freeze individual portions for lunch for the rest of the week. Yeah. And that's one that I do a lot of. So off camera here, I'm just fluffing my rice out of my zubachi using a plastic utensil uh, because it has a nonstick. We got beeps. Oh, no, my, uh, it appears my, my probe on my, so I have a, I have a built-in probe in my oven. Oh, very nice. Um, but it appears to like all electronic things be failing. Hmm. Well, funny you say that because now I have a message that says your browser has lost connection to your camera. Yeah, no, so, I noticed that you uh, you suddenly have a profile picture talking to us instead of a video feed. There we go. I'm back. That was fun. It didn't like your beeping. So, okay. So now I have asparagus oh, off to the nice. corner. Our chicken is looking red. Let me show everyone my chicken. So you can see it has a nice fiery look there. It's just happily cooking. <laughs> Now I do 375. Um, you can do 400. You can do 350. Uh, chicken thighs and chicken chicken thighs and chicken breasts with this much cheese and the protection are pretty flexible. Um, I don't think there's really a huge difference that I found because you're usually only cooking them for 15 to 45 minutes. And while he's finishing up, I'm actually just doing a little cleaning here off to the corner because this yeah, meal is pretty I'm much probably, done. I'm probably about five, ten minutes. Yeah, no problem. Um, Food is done when it's done, not before. So uh, on the losing weight, because you look fantastic. You've, you've lost a, you. a lot of weight. That's awesome. I'm, I'm, that, that's it's healthy. It's great. I'm sure you feel better. So, um, how did you do it? What, what was your What was your approach? Sure. Um, so yeah, I've lost as of today, I think 123 pounds total, uh, which is huge. Um, my approach was I turned 40 earlier this year, and I realized well, I actually, well turned 40. Yeah, has it only been a, I can't even remember when COVID started and stopped. So the year before, so the year before COVID, uh, the year of COVID, the year of COVID, and our Lord. I realized I had had a lot of fun getting fat, like un incredible amounts of fun getting fat because I love beer. I love liquor. I love food. And since I've been at Splunk, they've let me have a very generous expense account to travel the world, testing and eating foods. Uh, but come to DC, man, come visit. Uh, happily, I come fairly often. So we will we will go out and we shall drink and eat and be merry. Uh, go out. Uh, no, you will come here and I will host you and I will. All the better. Come. 
and uh, that's, that's we will experience my extensive whiskey collection. Even this is just getting more and more wonderful. So my day is made. Uh, but I realized I was kind of heading towards an unsustainable health trajectory. So although I'd had a lot of fun getting fat, uh, it wasn't fun anymore. So I decided to make some life changes. I actually did get a weight loss surgery. I did a lot of time researching it um, and had one in December of 2020 and then spent a lot of time working out and eating better and relearning my body and all sorts of things like that. And the biggest question I have is, oh, do, do you have to stop cooking everything you love? And the answer is no. I'm just not as hungry as I used to be anymore. Uh, I used to be starving. I'd wake up hungry. I'd go to bed hungry. And so for me, the weight loss surgery was really helpful for reducing my desire to eat all the time. And now I just eat much more healthy portions. Um, when I travel, I took some advice from a good friend of mine, James Brodsky, who's a very live man who's traveled even more than I have for work. And he just always has usually some sort of Caesar salad or grilled chicken salad when he travels, at least four days of five days he travels. So I started doing things like that for the limited post-COVID travel I've done. Um, and then just until I hit my goal weight, I've kind of uh, decided not to drink alcohol until I hit that. So I got six more pounds until I will be cheering you with bourbon and a uh, nice martini, but a little bit of time till then. Uh, when you do do that, so first of all, like the, the comments are blown up with everyone. Congratulations. Like, of course, that is a huge accomplishment. Like, that's a big deal. That's a hard lifestyle change um, that's yeah. part of where, where it's it, it's difficult. Um, I, I want to see that on Twitter, like some way of us oh, like, doing a, a, a toast because that's just. I love it. Yeah, no, it's that's, um, that's big. That's big. Yeah, I, I set a big goal for myself. Um, I used to cycle a lot before I joined. I actually lived in D.C. for many years in Old Town and would, I worked at DARPA. <laughs> And I used to cycle from Old Town, Alexandria to DARPA and back every day. And when I joined Splunk, just didn't work out. It's hard to cycle to California. And uh, I picked that up again. It's kind of my COVID exercise hobby post weight loss surgery. And I actually just did on Sunday, I did a ride with my good friend, Dave Harold. But we went up to Colorado and I did the triple bypass ride, which is 106 miles uh, over the Rockies, three passes and 10,000 feet of elevation gain. So that was a really nice, like, a lot of weight loss, and I did a huge, one of the hardest uh, organized rides you can do in America on a bike, and felt great. Now I'm talking to you, so it's all just win, 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 Bryce, and I, there's no, no down. I, I know. I think I'm on the downside of uh, what you just accomplished there, and then it's like asterisk, small italics, and Bryson. Uh, it's all relative. I mean, that's all in the past. Those were past victories. This is my victory today. Being on a unicorn show, yeah, that's a yeah lot cooking. People, a lot of people claim their friends. victory. It's a uh, only seventy five other people before me, so <laughs> I mean, I, I get I get you know pre triple digit cred, right? I assume we get a challenge coin after this with a unicorn and a uh, boss number. I I've started to think about how to do the swag. Like there 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 are goals here. Um, uh, I, I'm thinking maybe a cook off at DEF CON next year. Um, you know, something around those lines. Uh, so I don't you know, like to do competitive cooking. Mm. I, don't, I don't like the concept. I think that it's, it's, I mean, it's clearly made for TV to create drama around food. Of course. I like us all cooking together and sharing all of that. So um, in DEF CON's past, um, the last two notwithstanding, of course, um, I used to rent um, a large mansion and I would host backyard barbecues where I would cook for everybody um, and I would welcome every sous chef. And now that I've built up more of like a connection with the cooking community within this, I would love all of the the chefs that have, you know, to become and be a part of that. And like we cook for, you know, the 80, 100, 120 people. You've got my Victorian X. I'm with you. I bring my own knives. I'm 100 percent in. That sounds phenomenal. I love it. Uh, we've got a question from the chat. What surgery did you get? Uh, I had the gastric sleeve. Uh, for those of you who have ever looked into it or are curious, there's a variety of different ones. There's a gastric sleeve, a gastric bypass, and there's one other one. Um, third null switch, I think it's called. Um, my research for what was right for my body and for what was right for my psychological needs, because you actually go through a long process. You have psychologist visits, you have doctor visits, you have all sorts of things like that. And what worked best for me because of basically why, when I really evaluated why I got fat, it was I loved food and I was always hungry. And so for the gastric sleeve surgery, it actually cuts off the bottom of your stomach and then they kind of just wrap it back up. 
So there's no plumbing, there's no changing in how your stomach works, there's no changing in how your digestion works, uh, but there's actually a gland in the bottom of your stomach that produces that hungry feeling. And by cutting that off, I actually reduced a lot of those sensations I was having of being starving all the time. So for me, it worked out really well. It doesn't necessarily work for everyone. Depends on why you got fat um, or overweight or just unhealthy, depending on how you want to define it. So everyone has their own journey on it. But for me, that was the best one. And the recovery was relatively easy. And I'd had some really great folks in the cybersecurity community, actually, who I won't name out just because I don't know if they want to be. But one other thing I'll give you, if you do decide to think about it, is talk to people who've been through it. Uh, find people who will keep you accountable and answer any questions because it's not uh, it's not the easy button. It's a drastic button, but it's not an easy button for those of you who go through it or have thought about it. So, But for me, it was a huge change, and I'm very happy. Ah, so that is pretty looking. Oh, have we taken out? Let's take out. Let's see what we have yeah, here. here. So this is uh, that's what mine looks like. Yeah, that's pretty much the same as mine. So my temperatures are a little bit lower. I got one here. So I'm going to look at my handy dandy chart here, but I seem to remember that chicken thigh is about 165, 160, which is correct. So 165 is the uh, recommended FTA guidance. However, there's actually kind of a cheat on this is oh. that's of course like the, you know, statistically six Sigma kind of what you get. And it's, it's the easy button. It really is more the amount of time that the bacteria is subjected to it. A la that, sous vide. Which is why you can cook a steak at 129 and you're not breeding bacteria. You're still killing them. Well, then, with that information, what should we be looking at? Or what's another option for excitement here? I, I'm not going to try to do that math and do it and get sued on the air. <laughs> So I have one of these. Did, 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 did you just watch me put my CEO hat on? Yeah, that was great. <laughs> like, I, I see liability felt, here and no advantage. That was I have beautiful. No opinion. I don't know if you've ever seen the Alden Brown Good Eats episodes where the lawyers yeah, come oh, in and stop Alden Brown. Yeah. Alden Brown is my spirit animal of chefs. He's phenomenal. Uh, we're, we're, we just rewatched all of the Good Eat episodes, and we just uh, started the final season, the newest season that he's done. Um, he's another one who really changed how I cook and how I think about food. Just a phenomenal human being. Yeah, no. The, the, so of all of the things that he has, the one thing that I think most people underestimate, particularly, and it's one of the things I try to emphasize with this show. I mean, you and I talked about a little bit beforehand about the kinds of like recipes. Is mm -hmm. I don't want people to have to use one-off specialty equipment. Uh, you, you heard me say this is my one unit tasker that I picked up, and that's a straight Alton Brown uh, reference. So I 100% agree. There's a lot of snobbery around cooking. I mean, sous vide is one that I do quite a bit. Um, that's probably the most specialized piece of equipment I have. I do have a rice cooker, which I love uh, because I think it just makes the best tasting rice without any work. Um, other than that, cast iron pans. I mean, I don't even have – I have some really fancy knives here that I got as a gift, but my go-to is this Victoria X. Um, you have to make sure you get the Swiss version, but it has this nice cooking handle on the back, a Vibrex handle, really nice to use. And they're only like 20 bucks, 25 bucks. But these are what I tend to use all the time. Uh, we had a professional chef on, uh, I want to say four or five months ago. We made, uh, uh, I don't want to mix up because it was either jambalaya or gumbo, one of those mm -hmm. two. And he'd been, a, he'd been cooking for 15 years. He's now trying to get into InfoSec. Um, and he talked about knives. He's like, I buy the cheapest thing because I'd rather just throw it out and keep getting like a new knife. Fair enough. And I, I was like, that's a really interesting way to look at it. I'd never thought of that. It was fantastic. All right. So are you, are you plating right now? I am plating. All right. I will plate as well. Slightly off camera, but I'm visiting my rice. All right, I'm pretty happy. That looks pretty. Okay. Going back in. I have one of these who is definitely done, so that's perfect. All 
right. One minute here. Tastes so good. Now I'm pouring a little bit of the juice from the chicken that rendered out, which is mostly just fats. That's a good idea. Top. I'm going to do that too. And I'll take out some of my asparagus here. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I'll hit it with some chives. Okay. Let's see. I'll move this over. Just getting it prepared. Okay. Let's see. I'm moving. I'm moving. There we go. All right, you got to get in picture though. I know, I'm not good at this. We'll figure this out one day. Okay. There we are, paprika chicken. Ready? Cool. Get, get yes. your angle. Oh, there you go. Right. Smile. Boom. Done. There we go, paprika chicken. I hope everyone enjoys it. So uh, to close off uh, our charity for tonight, Rural Technology Fund does great things, uh, run by one of the luminaries in our industry, Chris Sanders. Um, great human being. They do great things, and it directly appeals to our future. We need smarter kids doing technology. Mm, so good. Ryan, thank you so much for uh, joining us, and uh, I look forward to uh, continuing to live tweet all the awesome things that you do every chance that I get. Um, I look forward to toasting you as you get those last six pounds off. Thank and you, sir. to a future post-COVID era, I look forward to cooking with you. I can't wait. It's going to be awesome. And thanks for everyone who tuned in. I hope you enjoyed it. And we kept fairly close, an hour and two minutes. So not bad. It's good to be timely. Y'all take care. Hashtag Unicorn Chef. Very well. Thanks a lot, Bryson. <laughs>